Thank you, Adrian, for these not-so-kind words. <laughs> Tom, Adrian, it's uh, an honor to be invited along out of retirement to give you a talk uh, on hypertension. It's a rotten title, so I changed the title. So the alternative and the more appropriate one is 40 years of undetected crime. So that's essentially what I'm going to talk about today. And I'd like to, my disclosures are that um, any slides that you might find amusing in any way, they've all been stolen uh, from Tom McDonald. <laughs> so just get that out of the way right at the beginning, because no doubt he will claim that at the end. <laughs> anyway, I start with good news. We're all living longer. Over approximately my lifetime in hypertension, life expectancy in the United K K in Kingdom has increased by about a decade in both uh, men and women. And of course, I would like to take responsibility for this, but sadly, there are exceptions. It's not all good news because even today, in the east end of Glasgow, life expectancy for a man is 53. It shows you the important influence of socioeconomic deprivation. And of course, as you all know, and this audience knows only too well, the reason for the high mortality rate in Glasgow is cardiovascular, and the most important correctable risk factor for cardiovascular disease is high blood pressure. So it's very appropriate that in Glasgow we take this quite seriously. And we were lucky when I started out in this game to have four, uh, sorry, three real giants in the field of hypertension working in Glasgow in the MRC blood pressure unit. Brown, Lever, and Robertson, as they were usually presented in papers, the strictly alphabetic order. And of course, Tony Lever and Ian Robertson are previous presidents of this society. Great men who contributed enormously to hypertension globally, not just in Glasgow. And Tony continued working with us until less than a decade ago. So throughout my career, Tony was around. So when I started all these years ago, blood pressure was very different. We seem to be dealing all the time with people with very severe high blood pressure. We worried about secondary hypertension. We did intensive investigations, and the drugs we had were pretty useless. Methyl dopa was the first line agent. And you didn't need to measure blood pressure when people are on methyl dopa to decide whether they, they might have responded. If they had no side effects, they clearly weren't taking the drugs. <laughs> and if they did, they said they felt hellish, then there was a possibility that blood pressure control might be quite good. Now we realize that intensive investigations are essentially a waste of time, except in Cambridge, Morris, uh, and we don't do that anymore. Things have changed. Hypertension now involves better drugs. It's high in the list of public health initiatives. We, in, we are interested in whether we can do more than simply control blood pressure. We still agonize about how low we should go. Resistant hypertension, as you've heard, is increasingly an issue. And guidelines. We have no shortage of guidelines. So I'm going to touch on a few of these uh, issues in a random manner. And for David, the previous speaker, in the United Kingdom, we like to insult one another. So. Many of my comments will be fairly insulting. <laughs> Just to get that other disclosure out of the way. <laughs> That's in case any of the audience didn't know me. <laughs> well, early on in my four decades in high blood pressure, we knew a lot about the management of hypertension. And I'm not going to go through all of these points uh, with this audience, because you all know this very well. We knew that high blood pressure was a bad thing, and lowering it was a good thing to do. And we could no matter how you packaged it, it was always a good thing to do. But there were deep thinkers amongst us who thought beyond that. So here's an example of one of these great thinkers <laughs> asking the question is, can we achieve something beyond simply lowering blood pressure? And he says, wow, I see the magic of new drugs. And of course, that's what it was all about in the 70s and 80s. It was all these old diuretics, spinal actin. I might say I came to Glasgow having worked with GD Saddle on the development of new aldosterone antagonists. So I was very much involved with spinal actin. 
But it was an old drug. Nobody wanted spinalactin. These new drugs were all going to be much better. But here we are, three or four decades later, and it's all been a bit difficult. It's been a mission impossible to show that any of them are really any better than the original drugs that we had all these years ago. And I would commend this review to you because this actually looks not just at this arbitrary defi definition of hypertension, this just looks at blood pressure lowering drugs in whoever they're administered to. And you see that the benefits that are achieved by lowering blood pressure are uh, independent of starting blood pressure, proportional to reduction in blood pressure, but importantly, all of the drugs do the same thing, provided blood pressure control is equivalent. And I think that was summarized quite nicely by Jan Stassen uh, in his editorial, which accompanied publication of the ASCIT study, which said, quite simply, that the best, most effective antihypertensive regimen is one which controls blood pressure without causing side effects. It's as simple as that. So the enthusiasts for the new drugs have moved away from trying to demonstrate some real benefit and have focused their attention on surrogate intermediate endpoints like new onset diabetes. And we've all seen this slide or something very similar to it, showing us that new drugs are very good, whereas beta blockers and diuretics are very bad for causing new onset diabetes. Well, we did an analysis of the value data, and, I'm sure, and I think you did a similar analysis with the ASCAT data, and we showed that just pay attention if you can read them to the yellow numbers on the left there, because that gives you the strength of the association. And you see that by far and away, the most important predictor of whether or not you get new onset diabetes was what your blood sugar was before you started the trial. So in fact, what happens is, and you see that blood pressure treatment is pretty low down on the list. So what happens is that people who nearly have diabetes stagger over this arbitrary line, which means that they've got diabetes. Now, does that matter a tuppy tosser? And I would suggest to you that it does not matter at all. And despite what Poulter will try and tell you, there's no good evidence that new onset diabetes carries with it any important risk at all. These are high risk people who just have their blood sugar increased a tiny wee bit during treatment. So I'm forced to the conclusion that thiazide and diuretics are drugs with no patents, they make no profits, and therefore they have no friends. And I'm indebted to a previous president of this society, Larry Ramsey, for this slide. And I think Larry was absolutely right. We are too easily driven by fashion. So all of this kind of tired me out. This was 20 or 30 years into this lifetime. And some of my undetected crimes became detected. <laughs> so what are yours, Tom? Yeah, that, yeah. that was, I think, at the Chinese Opera, wasn't it? Or something like that in Beijing. I'd had a very long flight. And there was no restriction on the amount of alcohol you could get on the flies <laughs> these days. In fact, I enjoyed a few quaffs just to build up my strength, because it was hard work, all of this, being nasty to everybody all the time and being incredibly skeptical about everything that goes on. And I got involved in doing some dreadful things, looking at uh, observational data at the Glasgow Blood Pressure Clinic. And Here's a photograph. I think Tom described this as a photograph of a man with intractable hemorrhoids. <laughs> the headline was not mine. This was some journalist who had interviewed me. Uh, the study, which in question I don't really want to talk about, I don't think it was correct. But the Glasgow Blood Pressure Clinic did produce some very important data. Uh, Chris Isles showed that using the retrospective analysis of the data, it was quite clear that it was a chief blood pressure which determined how people survived. And previous, prior to that, you may imagine, you might think, well, because we all know that, but prior to that, people thought it was the starting blood pressure that was more important. It's not the starting blood pressure, it's not where you start from, it's where you get to that actually determines your outcome. So this brings us on neatly uh, to the question of how low should we go? And there have been precious few decent studies looking at optimal blood pressure. Perhaps the most famous one is the Hypertension Optimal Treatment, HOT study, and in that study we showed that 
uh, in the general population, it didn't really seem to matter what the diastolic blood pressure achieved was. However, in high-risk people, the 1,501 people with type 2 diabetes, there was a clear step, stepwise reduction in risk with more rigorous control of blood pressure. And remember, these people were randomized not to particular treatments, but to target blood pressure. And the British Hypertension Society incorporated these data in their guidelines for the treatment of diabetic hypertension. But since then, there's been lots of question marks. Is lower really better? Many trials of rigorous blood pressure control in high-risk patients, no benefit. But the individual trials were hopelessly underpowered. They had wide confidence intervals which did not exclude major benefit. But nonetheless, they seemed to be accepted as showing that lowering blood pressure didn't really matter very much. And of course, to add to that, there was this suggestion that we could all be killed by lowering blood pressure, the J-curve. Let's go back to one of the early exponents of the J-curve. This is little Johnny Cruikshank uh, from Clatterbridge Hospital before he spent some time at Her Majesty's expense. And in this retrospective observational study, he showed that people who had established ischemic heart disease, if you lowered their blood pressure, their diastolic blood pressure to low levels, they had a higher mortality. And this, of course, is entirely plausible given that the coronary arteries are perfused during diastole and these people might have occluded coronary arteries. Well, we added the numbers into this figure from the Lancet just to show you that this is based on very small numbers. And it'll not surprise Ian Ford, but it may surprise the rest of you to know that this so-called J-curve is not statistically significantly different from a straight line. So the data that we have purporting the risks of lowering blood pressure too much essentially comes from pretty poor quality observational data. And of course, there must be a J-shaped or U-shaped relationship between uh, blood pressure and mortality because if your blood pressure is zero, you've got a 100% chance of being dead. <laughs> and what we don't know is where this point of inflection lies, the level of blood pressure above which you start to see increased risk. And all the evidence, to my mind, points to levels way below anything we ever achieve in clinical practice. But nonetheless, this sort of these sort of data, together with misinterpretation of the large underpowered studies, has resulted in us returning to the past, back to the future. The greatest danger to a man with high blood pressure lies in its discovery, because then some fool is certain to try and reduce it. Now, when that was published, that was, not an, that was a perfectly sensible statement, but it's no longer sensible yet, because we have fallen for the poor quality data and these rigorous control of blood pressure trials and the J-curve hypothesis, the real world, the people who actually treat high blood pressure take the view that since we don't think it's important to control blood pressure very tightly, why the hell should we bother? So that's been a major problem. And I'm glad to see that the Americans have sprinted to her help in this with the SPRINT study, which I'm no doubt you'll all be talking about during the course of this week. Something else that became apparent during, as a sort of spinner from these trials, that it might not just be the eventual control of blood pressure, because when we designed the value study and when we designed the ASCOT study, we thought that as long as blood pressure control was achieved after several months, that was fine. But then we ran into this problem, that in both of these trials, you see, some people achieved control uh, quite early on. Others failed to achieve control. And it appeared that no matter how many drugs you added in as time went by, you never caught up. These two uh, panels, the top and the bottom panel, are actually superimposable, but it just shows you in the upper panel we're trying to ex emphasize the difference in blood pressure. In the lower panel, we're trying to disguise it. Both of them are exactly the same. But the main message is that if you don't get the blood pressure down quickly, then you might never get there. And there is interesting observational data, such as from the value study, suggesting that in people who achieve control early, they do better than in those who achieve the same control, but only much later. So maybe when we're thinking about targets, we should be thinking not just of levels, but time to these levels. And at least in high-risk patients, 
we should be aiming to get there quickly. And Morris, Tom, and to a very small extent, I looked at this in a prototype trial, the Accelerate study, which showed that indeed by using combination therapy early on, we got quicker blood pressure control, hardly surprising, but also better eventual blood pressure control, supporting this never catch up phenomenon. And there was no downside that there were fewer side effects in those people who were given combination treatment from the outset. So maybe we should be thinking not only of rigorous control of blood pressure, but getting there rather quickly. Now resistant hypertension is a big area and you've heard a very illuminating talk on the subject uh, from the previous speaker. And I'm really going to touch on two issues here. Blood pressure measurement, which David's already touched on, and non-drug treatment. Blood pressure measurement is incredibly boring. And my slide will show you how not to measure blood pressure. This is not a good way to measure blood pressure. You'll sort of the cuff is far too narrow. And it's way above the level of the heart, so we're going to get inaccurate readings. Because for many of my patients, this is exactly how I'd like to measure their blood pressure. <laughs> but you tend to get struck off uh, when you do that sort of thing. So blood pressure measurement is crap. And um, the son of one of the great founders of this society, uh, Tom Pickering, who knew more about blood pressure measurement than most, he made the very reasonable point that, um, oh, well, I could find the point, <laughs> that blood pressure measurement was much more and much too serious to be left to doctors who don't measure blood pressure well and never will. Martin Myers in Canada did a little study which I think illustrates, that illustrates I think a similar point to one that you have made David already, which is that if you look at routine physicians measuring blood pressure, they get higher levels than so-called specialists like, like us. But the nurses in the audience, they can congratulate themselves because they're much better. And their readings are very similar to ambulatory readings. So if you look at what happens to white coat hypertension is it essentially disappears like snarf headache when you measure blood pressure properly. So this notion that we should go to ambulatory monitoring, oh God, rather than just teaching people how to measure blood pressure, Brian, 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 what were you thinking about? Because basically there's no evidence that not treating these people, because remember that high blood pressure, the definition of hypertension is arbitrary. So all you're doing is discriminating between people above and below this arbitrary line. There's absolutely no evidence that the people with white coat hypertension don't get equivalent benefit from lowering blood pressure than those who have true hypertension. But David's absolutely right. We need to measure blood pressure properly. The other thing I'd like to touch on is sympathetic, renal sympathetic denervation, which may in fact be wonderful. I don't know the answer to that. But something went horribly wrong. And the reason I show this is because they did not, they get so carried away that they did studies which lacked scientific rigor. Randomized, uncontrolled trials, many biases, failure to acknowledge and to allow for other factors. So basically this was poor quality science. The technique might be fine, but the science was very bad. And it reminds us that two months is a very long time in clinical research. In February 2014, the Lancet thought this was the best thing since sliced bread. It was going to be a cure not just for hypertension, but just about everything else that, that humanity suffers from. And then three months later, it hits the buffer. So the message to you young members in the audience, I'm looking around, I said there are one or two younger members in the audience. If the results are too good to be true, they probably aren't true. So there's no easy answers in this life. So I'll finish off by saying a word or two about the guidelines for the management of hypertension. First of all, who have benefited from it? Well, the authors of the guidelines committee, it's very good. You get lots of citations. Managers like them because they can tell us what to do and lawyers love them because they can sue us. And always remember that if we look for advice from someone away above and beyond medicine, you find good men don't need rules. This was Doctor Who uh, in 2011. So just remember the weakness of the guidelines. The evidence is very often incomplete. The trials which stoke up the evidence are often underpowered. There's often lack of robust data. And the recommendations are often based on opinion modified by prejudice. <laughs>
So I'm very sad to say that I used to be very proud of the British Hypertension Society guidelines, but sadly, you're slipping down the same slippery slope that the Europeans slipped down a decade ago. So be very careful. I hope, and I think Morris is to be congratulated, that we now have a research framework where we might address some of the questions which are needed to devise guidelines. So the British Hypertension Research Model might well hit the target, Morris, and avoid these problems in the future. In the future, I'm an old guy. I'll not be here again. Lots of nice young people in the audience. What does the future hold? Well, we have to go to the great poet of the 20th century to find out about the future because it's the unknown. And when you read this at first, you think this is just gibberish. But in fact, he's very sensible. And it's the unknown unknowns that you young people are going to have to work out and solve in the future. And I hope you'll not get involved, as I see so often in this society, with intellectual masturbation, where you can't see the wood for the trees. Caution, this sign has sharp edges. Do not touch the edge of the sign. That's what the British Hypertension Society is increasingly interested in. Uh, but this, also the bridge, is out ahead. That's really what you're interested in. So let's get our priorities right, chaps, eh? as we move ahead. So that's all I'm going to say, Tom. I'm going to conclude with uh, apologies to uh, another great man, Douglas Adams. The first 10 years were the worst. The second 10 years were the worst too. <laughs> the third 10 years I didn't enjoy at all. And after that it all went a bit of a decline. <laughs> this of course is from Marvin the Paranoid Android, otherwise known as Mark Caulfield, from the restaurant at the end of the universe. And I'll finish off with my thanks to you all. Slight modification of one of uh, Douglas Adams' books. So long, and thanks for all the fun. Thank you very much indeed.